Hello, beautiful people. It's a gorgeous Monday morning here in Perth, Australia, and I am coming to you live on Instagram and then later on YouTube. I transferred over to my YouTube channel, and that's uh, Art of Birthing. And tonight we get to hear from two midwifery leaders around the globe. And I'm so excited to talk to these midwives in Mexico and in Bolivia. So we're gonna hear reports about what's happening in their communities and um, what's changing in their practices as a result of the international pandemic. And we're also gonna spend time to <clears throat> love and support each other and just feel like uh, you're not alone. You've got people in your corner, you've got support and um, midwives have always been a little bit <clears throat> ostracized, well not always, but at least for the last hundred years, have been a little bit marginalized, a little bit ostracized, a little bit on the side of uh, culture. Um, and so now in these really kind of crazy times, it's even more important um, that we feel like we have community. Um, so that's what I'm doing, I'm holding space for community. <clears throat> I hope that the stress is not overwhelming you. I hope that you're remembering to take time for yourself and doing self-care. And um, let's uh, get really excited for who we get to hear from. We're starting with a midwife in Bolivia. Um, and she has worked for Medicine Sans Frontières, um, Doctors Without Borders, for a while. I think several locations, so we'll get to hear about that. And I'm sure that she has lots and lots of tricks and techniques for working in um, low resource areas or areas where there is not um, the expected resources. So we're excited to hear from that. Um, and then after, stay tuned because we will get to hear from a midwife in Mexico. Alrighty, so here we are. See if I can make it work. There we go. I think it's working. Yeah, it's working. Hi, Fred. I can hear you, but I can't see you, which is probably my Wi-Fi problem, not yours. Um, well, is your, you do have the split screen? Okay, then it's happening, even if it's not happening on my end. How are you? Really great. So where are you and who are you? Will you introduce yourself? Can you speak up, dear? I can't quite hear you. Can you speak up? There, that's better. That's so much better. Yeah. Hey. Oop. We lost you, I think. Wi-Fi, such a problem. <clears throat> I think she's coming back. Here she comes. Okay. There. Okay. Yes, it worked all the way it's supposed to. Great. It was not. It was not me. <laughs> it's the technology. <laughs> it's cool. You're here. Hi. Welcome. Can you see and hear me now? Yes, yes, now you're there. So start over, tell us who you are and where you are. Okay, sure. I'm Christine, I'm in uh, La Paz, Bolivia. I've been here since January. I work for Doctors Without Borders at Princess, so um, I, I go on missions in different places. So this is I my see. current mission. So how, how many years have you been doing this? How many months? months, years with Médecins Sans Frontières, and then as a CPM, um, where have you been? How many years have you been doing it? Yeah, last year I was in uh, Sierra Leone <clears throat> for nine months. Uh, prior to okay. that, I was in Afghanistan, but I was with a different organization in Afghanistan, um, MSF, I Send Americans to the Middle East, and I really wanted I to go to Afghanistan. So, I see. Um, wow. I was there for six months. I bet you have just amassed so much wisdom and experience. Um, how, how long have you been a midwife? Uh, 31 years. Wow. Yes, I'm right. I bet it's oodles and oodles. Well, so the first thing I guess I would say is, um, can you tell us how Medicine Sans Frontières is, is responding to this pandemic? What is happening in your community? 
Sure. Um, so, I mean, they're responding globally. Uh, they have a lot yeah. of um, different uh, projects all over the world. And we have you know, yeah. 40,000 people working all over the world. Um, yeah. Specifically, so the way it works with MSF is, for example, here, we're here doing a maternal infant health project. Yeah. And that's what we're here to do. So we're not authorized to do anything else until the Ministry of Health um, invites us to do so. Yeah. Um, so we can't really do much in the way of response other than support the Ministry of Health in the uh, clinics that we are uh, working with. So, and I also want to make it clear in this um, in this video that I'm speaking as myself for myself. Um, as of course. Wife, but not specifically for MSF. I'm happy to talk about MSF, but... Um, for I'm sure, for sure. ...on behalf of them right now, just to make that clear. That's clear. Yeah, and thanks for that clarity. Yeah, this yeah. is not a, a, um, a policy kind of a little broadcast. This is definitely personal. We want to hear from specific midwives, so the intent is definitely to hear about you and how you are. Um, so you have been working for um, MSF for multiple locations, multiple years. You're currently in Bolivia. What, if anything, is changing about the way you're delivering care as a result of the pandemic? What's happening in Bolivia? That's a really good question. So as of today, we have about, we have 24 confirmed cases. Um, there are 170-ish um, suspected cases that are pending. Okay. Like everywhere, there's not enough testing. Um, yeah. There's not enough test kits necessarily. Yeah. What happens here is that um, people get swabbed and then they have to they have to fly the test. There's one lab in the whole country, and they have to oh. fly the kit to Santa Cruz where they get tested. So it's oh. a three or four day turnaround. It's probably a couple of days there as well, but um, it takes a little bit longer here. So right. um, we'll see a lot more, um, you know, uh, positive test results coming in later. Um, right. But there's a delay at this point. <clears throat> um, so basically uh, what's happening here is uh, as of midnight, this last night, um, I, I'm here in my apartment and um, we have, I have um, a phone call tomorrow um, with the medical team that I work with to figure out how we're going to go about our work um, in supporting the clinic, but um, people aren't allowed to leave their, their home. Um, even the, for uh, essential services, like like yeah, healthcare? Yes, uh, essential um, uh, workers can, but because we are, we are not part of the workforce, we're humanitarian oh. aid, and we're not here in response to oh, the, virus the pandemic specifically. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So right. it makes it complicated. So we are forced to work the hours that, um, or go out during the hours that anybody else can go out, which is to get groceries between eight and twelve. I and see. So we have to, we can work those hours. Um, as expat. Now our national staff is working 24 hours. Shift. Of course, of course, and yeah. Actually, I was on a 24 hour shift when, uh, when I got called and told about the quarantine and I, I see. It, um, short because they didn't want that. They didn't want me to be in trouble being out during the quarantine. So, wow. A little bit That's so intense. So, yeah. And so we're seeing a lot of, um, you know, some mothers that are um, about to give birth there uh, in the clinic are, are frightened just like the mothers any place in the world. Um, they're um, really yeah. concerned about what's going to happen um, if, if they go to the hospital. So uh, we have to convince them. But the problem here in Sierra Leone is the reason why MSF is here. Oh, you mean Bolivia? Bolivia. I'm sorry, <laughs> Bolivia. Yeah. Nine yeah. It's, I, yeah. I'm tired. Nine months in Sierra Leone. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's still in your brain. Yeah, so it's a beautiful place. Yeah. Oh, it it is. 
Um, so the problem here in Bolivia is that um, we have the highest uh, maternal mortality rate in all of um, all of Latin America. So that's why Bolivia oh, has wow. this project here. And that's why oh, we have wow. that, the project in Sierra Leone. They have the highest maternal right. mortality rate in the world. So right. it's, um, yeah, so it's, it's problematic. So the women here, um, we, you know, they're discouraged from birthing at home. And uh -huh. um, a lot of times I'm asked, you know, I'm a home birth midwife and I'm supportive of home birth. Right. But the women right. that I help when I'm in the United States and the women that birth at home in Europe and Canada, those are healthy women with healthy babies. The women here right. are the highest risk in, uh, in all of Latin America and they really need to be birthing um, where they can get uh, emergency medication and so forth. Um, and, that's and the resources aren't doing. set up to, to have home births in, in your that's region, correct. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting about Bolivia is that they do not have Uh huh. But those yeah. are those are recognized as traditional birth attendants, and they're empirically trained. Um, right. But they're not recognized in any way. So. Um, right. I mean, they're recognized as TBAs, but then but there are no midwives in the healthcare system. So I see. When I'm in the clinic, um, I'm actually um, I supervise seven doctors that work throughout our clinic. Um. And when I go into the clinic and when women are birthing, I do not introduce myself as a midwife because it is very confusing to everyone uh, that a uh -huh. midwife would be in a clinic working because they uh -huh. don't, midwives aren't trained here. So, I see. Um, How interesting. So it's even confusing for the doctors and nurses. So yeah. um, when I'm introduced by MSF, I am the um, sexual and reproductive health reference. That's what I am. <laughs> so wow. I can't call wow. myself a doctor, and then I call myself a midwife. They're all very confused because of no wow. at all. Right, right. How interesting. The politics of midwifery around the globe are really fascinating. <laughs> it's a whole other thing, isn't it? Wow. <clears throat> wow. Well, so tell us, how, how are you? How is your spirit to go from working a 24-hour shift to being housebound? How are you? Oh, I'm a little confused. <laughs> no, um, it's interesting because I was supposed to be here for three months. My mission is up in about a month. Um, I'm going to be here a lot longer than three months. Yeah. I'm used to being away um, for long periods of time. Like I said, I, I was in Sierra Leone nine months, and that was yeah. that was very, very long. Um, we get breaks. Oops. Or well, theoretically, we're supposed to get breaks. Yeah. Um, a little bit. Um, I we time. lost. We lost that reception. Will you say that again? Yeah. For me, it's it's feeling a little bit isolating um, now. Um, at times because I don't know the length of my mission. Um, but right. I will say that I was given the choice um, when we saw this coming maybe last week or so. Uh, I talked with my medical coordinator um, and also um, with my career manager in New York. And um, I, I made the decision to stay. They could have gotten me out before before they closed all of the flights, because there are no flights in or out, all the borders are closed. Nobody's right. going to be there. Um, right. So the clinics, I yeah. use Sarah, are an hour and a half from me. So I'm in La Paz, and they're up in El Alto. So, I see. Um, so we have to travel. Wow. And now everything is teleconference and video conference and all of this, because trying to social distance and all that. Well, so um, 
you've you've worked and lived in lots of places over a 31 year career. Um, what kind of advice do you have for midwives around the globe? Um, not necessarily just American, we have an international audience who who might be listening and and need this kind of advice, this kind of wisdom from from a midwife like yourself. What would you share? Can you start over? We lost reception again. Will you try it again? Sure. Just to be um, flexible and creative. Um, and uh, yeah. And you just really have to, like, in a situation like this, which is unprecedented, I think I've heard that word about 90,000 times in the last week, but it really <laughs> is. And it's just, I mean, there's yeah. just news coming out every day that's different. Yeah. And not, not much of it is very good, um, but, yeah. but we have to go with what we know. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, just being flexible. And, and honestly, for me, uh, I, I have a sense of humor, and I try to laugh as much as I possibly can. And I, um, I really, that's, that's all you can do. And sometimes it is gallows humor. Sometimes it's very dark. And, uh, but yeah. my, my, my friends know and understand uh, my humor. Okay. But it's not always appreciated by people who don't know me. But it's really how, otherwise, honestly, it's really difficult to get through. I mean, we, yeah. besides the pandemic um, here, you know, in a developing country, it's, it's, it's hard, some of the things. That, that it is hard. I mean, it's hard to a see. A 13-year-old that died yeah. last last week that came in from yeah. school and had died from like a seizure or something. Things you're just not expecting. And then right. there they are. And it's like, this should not happen. And mm. so it's that kind of stuff that I, yeah. you just have to keep going. So, yeah. I mean, I just think being, being flexible and then just learning as much as you can. And it's hard to keep up on all of this stuff that's coming yeah. out. It really is. Yeah. So um, do you have a self-care regimen? Do you have um, a ritual that you do that helps keep you sane when you're living so far from home or when life is so uh, unpredictable? Yeah, I do. Um, I have my little uh, rituals. I, I get up in the morning and um, usually do some yoga while I start my boiling water for my coffee. And coffee is like my – it's my – I – of it, I look forward yeah. to it. Um, then I just spend some time uh, before I have to go into work, um, or before I'm going to deal with people. I don't, you know, now it's the first day of quarantine, so I don't know how it's going to be, but it will definitely start out still that same way. Um, yeah. And I try to connect Good. with people. Um, like I said, I've been feeling yeah. pretty isolated because of everything going yeah. on in the United States. I feel very forgotten about. <laughs> yeah. By, like, all my friends and family because, well, but yeah, family, I can family, identify with that. myself, but yeah, they're yeah. pretty absorbed in their own, in the, in the drama there. And I'm like, Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm here. Yeah. And you know, and I, and I can't, I can't escape. And I don't, I don't really have like friends here. I have, there's the team and they're lovely yeah. people, but it's, they're not like my friends and my dogs aren't here. And you know, so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm away from home, and um, I think people don't understand really how much uh, humanitarians in general sacrifice to go. Yes, we do. Yeah. We love it, and we thrive on it. Yeah, but it's, it really is hard. Um, yeah, and we have a whole psychosocial unit in New York um, just to deal with us and our, yeah. you know, our mental health. So, um, and they're yeah. all um, they've all been in touch with all of us. Um, because they know, they know that we don't That's know good. when we're coming home. We we just don't know. So it's a little, it's a little yeah. It, it's, it's, it adds a whole nother dynamic, doesn't it? Like you can convince yourself to like get on board and be there when you know an end time, but when you don't know the end time, yeah. it's like what do you do? What do you even do with yourself, especially with quarantine? I know I'm feeling it too. Maybe we can make a, a, a regular date to talk because <laughs> I'm sort of in the same boat. Um, yeah. I'm I'm randomly in Australia. I didn't even know I'd be here a week ago. And now they've just closed the borders here too. So um, I'm staying, um, but I don't know for how long or really what I'm doing. And yeah, I feel you. It's very weird. Um, yeah. 
so uh, what about um, actually the practice of midwifery? Um, we don't know exactly which direction this pandemic is going to take us. Um, certainly in low resource and developing environments, um, it's always kind of invent as you go and figure it out and you never quite know the resources you're going to have or who's going to walk in the door. And it's very much a, the definition of flexibility. But I think one of the things that echoing themes I keep hearing when I talk to midwives around the globe is that um, midwives who are used to being in very quote unquote high resource center environments um, with all the stuff um, are really fearing for um, having to do births or having an actual societal kind of breakdown in such a way that they won't have access to what they're used to doing with births. Um, you've worked in lots of different environments. What do you say to that or what tricks or techniques do you have to offer? Um, specifically to those that are worried about all of their, their gadgets and things, not, not. Yeah. Or just, yeah. yeah. Or even, I mean, like it is not typical in the U S or in, in the UK or in Canada to have someone who was not previously planning to have midwifery care suddenly show up. Yeah. Um, and right. so there, a lot of people are feeling this, like, how do I even risk assess and who, you know, if the hospitals are filled, what do I do with these people? Do you have advice? You know, really, I think we still have to take the time to um, to uh, assess everybody um, and see if there's. I mean, it's still they still have to be a, a good candidate, a good fit for that particular yeah. midwife. You know, yeah. my experience is there are so many midwives out there that people are going to find the person that fits with them. And, and if you end up turning somebody away because you're not comfortable um, with them, maybe coming late into care or they're, it's not a good fit for you, um, you know, refer them to somebody else. They're going to find a good, good fit somewhere. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I do. Apparently a lot of um, midwives are getting late into care people who originally yeah. weren't planning to, to be yeah. at home. And, and yeah. that is a higher risk. And I yeah. mean, think about that like if I was in the United States and still practicing there yeah um, yeah what that would be like and you know it is it is um it is definitely riskier and um I just think you have to take it case by case uh yeah it'll be interesting to see when this is all said and done um midwives experiences and and yeah what's happened and Maybe it will turn the tide even more on midwifery and make some big changes, um, specifically yeah, I, in the United States where we need some. Yeah, I'm I'm hopeful, but we keep hearing reports of areas where even home birth is fairly um, available. Um, the the national midwifery organizations are discouraging home birth and and asking everyone to come to the hospital, presumably to centralize equipment and and services, um, but it doesn't always get interpreted in that way around the globe. So uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see when we talked to the midwives, uh, the midwife in uh, the Netherlands, Helene, she said that actually her national organization has encouraged every healthy low risk person to stay home no matter what. Um, and then there's large parts of UK that are doing the same thing. Um, but Quebec just came out and said that they have, banned home birth. Midwives are all required to take their clients to the hospital, including people who already had plans for a home birth. So that's a little concerning. But I mean, I think everyone's doing the absolute best they can. And I'm sure that when we're talking about resources and the scale that this is at, um, centralizing services, you know, in, in one part of my brain, that can make sense. And another part with an epidemic piece doesn't make sense. But I don't know, I'm I'm not the one making those policy choices. Um, yeah. What about um, what about the actual physicality of midwifery? Um, um, do you have any advice for how to keep yourself safe? Um, I don't know. I, everyone's kind of searching for this. How much is too much PPE, and how much is required? Maybe you don't have a comment on that, but I invite you if you do. Well, no, I mean, my, my thoughts are um, teleconferencing as much as 
televisits as much as you can, and which is really hard. You, we want to put our hands on the yeah. belly because it gives us so much information. So that's yeah. difficult, and I get that. Um, but I think yeah. for um, for the sake of, of um, as little contact as possible, um, doing as much as you can, it's going to take us um, certainly in low resource and developing environments. Um, it's always kind of invent as you go and figure it out and you never quite know the resources you're going to have or who's going to walk in the door. And it's very much a, the definition of flexibility. But I think one of the things that echoing themes I keep hearing when I talk to midwives around the globe is that um, midwives who are used to being in very quote unquote high resource center environments um, with all the stuff um, are really fearing for um, having to do births or having an actual societal kind of breakdown in such a way that they won't have access to what they're used to doing with births. Um, you've worked in lots of different environments. What do you say to that or what tricks or techniques do you have to offer? Um, specifically to those that are worried about all of their, their gadgets and things, not, not. Yeah. Or just, yeah. yeah, or even, I mean, like it is not typical in the U.S. or in in the U.K. or in Canada to have someone who was not previously planning to have midwifery care suddenly show up. Yeah. Um, and right. so there, a lot of people are feeling this, like, how do I even risk assess? And who, you know, if the hospitals are filled, what do I do with these people? Do you have advice? You know, really, I think we still have to take the time to um, to uh, assess everybody um, and see if there's, I mean, it's still, they still have to be a, a good candidate, a good fit for that particular yeah. midwife. You know, yeah. my experience is there are so many midwives out there that people are going to find the person that fits with them. And, and if you end up turning somebody away because you're not comfortable um, with them maybe coming late into care or they're, it's not a good fit for you, um, you know, refer them to somebody else. They're going to find a good, good fit somewhere. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I, I do. Apparently a lot of um, midwives are getting late into care people who originally yeah. weren't planning to, to be yeah. at home. And, and yeah. that is a higher risk. And I yeah. think about that. Like if I was in the United States and still practicing there. Yeah, um, yeah what that would be like and you know it is it is um it is definitely riskier and um i just think you have to take it case by case uh yeah it'll be interesting to see when this is all said and done um midwife experiences and and yeah. what, what's happened and maybe it will turn the tide even more on midwifery and make some big changes um specifically yeah, I, in the united states where we need some yeah, I'm I'm hopeful, but we keep hearing reports of areas where even home birth is fairly um, available. Um, the the national midwifery organizations are discouraging home birth and and asking everyone to come to the hospital, presumably to centralize equipment and and services. Um, but it, it doesn't always get interpreted in that way around the globe. So uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see when we talk to the midwives. Uh, the midwife in uh, the Netherlands, Helene, she said that actually her national organization has encouraged every healthy low risk person to stay home no matter what. Um, and then there's large parts of UK that are doing the same thing. Um, but Quebec just came out and said that they have banned home birth. Midwives are all required to take their clients to the hospital, including people who already had plans for a home birth. So that's a little concerning, but I mean, I think everyone's doing the absolute best they can. And I'm sure that when we're talking about resources and the scale that this is at, um, centralizing services, you know, in, in one part of my brain, that can make sense. And another part with an epidemic piece it doesn't make sense. But I don't know. I'm, I'm not the one making those policy choices. Um, yeah. What about, um, what about the actual physicality of midwifery? Um, um, do you have any advice for how to keep yourself safe? Um, I don't know. I, everyone's kind of searching for this. 
how much is too much PPE and how much is required. Maybe you don't have a comment on that, but I invite you if you do. Well, no, I mean, my, my thoughts are um, teleconferencing as much as televisits as much as you can, and which is really hard. You, we want to put our hands on the yeah. belly because it gives us so much information. So that's yeah. difficult, and I get that. Um, but I think yeah. for um, for the sake of, of um, as little contact as possible, um, doing as much as you can um, on yeah. video and showing up the yeah. earth, um, it's, uh, I think it's a wise decision in limiting the number of people at the birth and no sick people. I think it has to be very similar to what the hospitals are doing. Um, and I don't think it's an overreaction. Yeah. I've watched the numbers go up in the United States. I yeah. That's phenomenal. It's almost exponential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, in that regard, yeah. I think um, we, we just really have to um, be very cautious because um, midwives, we're going to start seeing midwives getting sick. I mean, there will be one or two, you yeah. know. What happens to all her clients? So then that's where we're going to see people having to really scramble. Yeah. It's very scary, really it's very scary. Um, yeah. And I'm far away. Yeah, and I know. It all unfolds from far, far away. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And here we have the opposite. Yeah, well, I'm that, watching you know, it. Um, yeah. I was saying we're discouraging people, of course, from staying home here because we always – we always have because they don't have the resources and we're very afraid right. that women are going to start staying home more. I mean, they still, they do anyway, but, right. um, but more women are going to stay home and they stay home and they stay home with their husbands or their mothers or mothers-in-law. It's not like they have a skilled attendant with them. Right. And, and in fact, even um, the night, the, the last night that I worked on um, Saturday, um, we did have um, a mass appendage come in from home um, wow. by somebody who was afraid to come in. And, uh, wow. and, and then, of oh. course, then they did call and come in and we had to dispatch the ambulance and so forth. So, mm. um, so we're already starting to see it, and we haven't even hit our stride with, with cases and stuff yet. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm watching it here unfold, and the, the latest news reports here in Western Australia is that um, at the current rate of containment, which is not as well as some countries, but not certainly as scary as the U.S., um, the entire hospital system will be overwhelmed full to capacity with six doc sick doctors and nurses um, by March 30th. So they've got all these calls out for 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 retired nurses um, to come back to care. I'm thinking about applying to work here because I don't know if I can just sit here and do nothing. <laughs> right. So, right. Yeah. And you have to imagine um, that retired nurses going in, um, yeah. if they're retired, they're likely over the age of 60. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. I know some people retire younger. But then no, but not usually in nursing. And then they're at risk. Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Then they're a higher yeah. risk population. I'm not saying they shouldn't do it by any means. I'm just no, I'm just but worried. yeah, you can imagine a lot of yeah. people are are concerned about that. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and I'm I'm sure very concerned be about the U.S. I think it's going to be a real disaster. And I I yeah, I don't want to spread any fear mongering or anxiety about it. But I'm. I'm really worried about the U.S. and I'm I'm so glad that there are our community-based midwives, most of the country, who are ready to support um, people who do choose to stay home. Uh, but I want to help them stay protected. Um, so uh, yeah, continuing to do the telemedicine. We're about to produce a video about actually running a telemedicine appointment, what that looks like, what info to ask, all those pieces. Nice. Yeah. And then um, yeah, just remembering to. 
do all the things we're being told, hand washing and distance and masks and all the things. Um, well, it's been such a great pleasure to speak with you. Um, will you um, uh, close this evening's call with um, any words of wisdom, advice, love for the midwives around the planet? Oh, man. Yeah, it's, um, I, don't have a, I don't have a prepared statement, but. So, um, no, you're not I, supposed to, just from your heart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I honestly, it, yeah, um, being the, the only midwife here, not having any other um, sister midwife um, here, that, that too is a little bit isolating for me. So yeah. I really appreciate, um, I appreciate the work that everybody um, yeah. around the globe is doing. All the, the MSF midwives, we, we have a group yeah. on, on Facebook, and I don't know yeah. most of them personally, but we're just online and you know, yeah. everybody's just doing the best that they can. And I would, yeah. I would just say, you know, find find your best. This is the time to bring your best self forward. Oh, and, beautiful. Uh, if there's any, you know, any sort of disagreements or rancor or animosity or whatever, it's the time to put that on the shelf right now. You can deal with that later. But right now we all just need to come together and ask each other for help, information, advice, um, whether it's, you know, the person next to you or, or across the, the ocean. I'm always here. Anybody can ask me yes. anything they want anytime, you know, I'm yes. happy to give advice, but really just, you know, open your heart to all the different possibilities out there um, and, awesome. and, lives and just support each other. That's the most important thing, really, because that's how we're going to get through this and be able to support these mothers bringing these babies onto the planet in this really um really heroin mm. so yeah <laughs> thank you so much it's such thank a pleasure to have this you. connection i'm so grateful oh, for you and your delightful. time and i'm gonna thank i'm gonna hold space you. for you there in your little apartment with your beautiful view out over the city behind you thank i'm gonna send you lots of love and let's seriously stay in touch because i'm in the same boat totally alone in a country that's not mine so yeah. Okay, sounds good. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.